Thank you, colleagues. Uh, we will resume. And the question is that motion 21090 in the name of Ben McPherson on the Scottish rate resolution be agreed and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 21090 in the name, name of Ben McPherson is yes, 58, no, 50. There were five abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And the rate resolution is agreed. Now we're going to move on now to the next item of business, which is an Education and Skills Committee debate on motion 21089 in the name of Claire Adamson on STEM in early years education. I should also highlight that stage three proceedings in the budget will take place on Thursday. Thank you. I would encourage members who wish to contribute to this debate to press their request to speak buttons. And can I call on Claire Adamson to speak to and move the motion? Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I start by thanking my colleagues from the Education Committee who took part in the deliberations around our inquiry into STEM in early years education. I'd like also to thank the clerks for the work that they have put into the inquiry and also the many people who contributed both in providing evidence at committee and through some of the uh, interactions that we did over the course of our deliberations. Particularly, I'd like to thank um, teacher Tony Scullion, who not only gave evidence to the committee, but also um, brought along uh, some colleagues to um, hold a dress code hackathon to launch a report and we had 10 teams of S1 girls taking part, some of whom had never coded before, but managed to produce some outstanding work on that day. Presiding officer, this week is Scottish Apprenticeship Week, which encourages our young people to consider where their talents could take them, to let their imagination drive their ambition. However, our committee heard back in March 2019 that young people as young as six years old often have a fixed idea of the jobs they could do. More importantly, what jobs were not for them? These preconceptions, regularly based on gender or social circumstance, can limit their aspirations. It curtails a young person's ambition to ham it hampers Scotland's ability to attract people to STEM-related careers, careers that will be vital to the development of our workforce through the fourth industrial revolution. That is what made the formative years and early years STEM teaching the focus of our inquiry. We visited the Primary Science Teaching Trust Education Conference at the SECC in um, Edinburgh. Sorry, that's the Glasgow one, ECC in Edinburgh, <laughs> which brought to life the potential of innovation at school level and the, the young people we saw on that day had amazing projects and were very eloquent about what they were learning about STEM in school. We also held a workshop at the Scottish Learning Festival to test out some of our findings um, from formal evidence on a group of around 50 teachers and early years practitioners. And that was at the SECC. The committee was struck by the volume of groundbreaking work taking place across Scotland. We met self titled STEM converts, people who had not studied STEM at, at university or college, but had taken a passion for STEM into their 
um, teaching in the early years. Presiding officer, the challenges of unconscious bias and its impact on gender balance was a recurring theme of the evidence the committee heard, as was the disadvantage of being from a deprived background. Also, ensuring that children from rural and remote areas receive the same range and regularity of opportunities as those from urban areas was also a strong theme. The committee has developed 22 recommendations which align with the ambitions of the government's STEM strategy. A key takeaway was the importance of improving teacher and early years practitioners' confidence, particularly in technology and in engineering. One teacher, Lorna Hay, who has a passion for engineering, rightly outlined that STEM is made of four constituent parts, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and that bundling the four together can be a hindrance to identifying the subjects teachers have confidence in and where more appropriate support is needed and could be offered. Some student teachers suggested they could not possibly cover STEM in sufficient detail to feel confident. Once teachers are qualified, the need for continuing professional development was clear. It was important to have more information on the prevalence of CPD in STEM disciplines across the teaching profession. We heard about the advantages of cluster working where nurseries, primary schools and high schools can collaborate together to share knowledge and experience. But of course, finding time in a busy curriculum is never easy. And some witnesses cited the inability to source staff cover for lessons as an inhibitor to collaboration and to CPD. A regular suggestion from teachers was that increased non-contact time could make time to dedicate, uh, for dedicated CPD in STEM areas. We also heard about some of the physical challenges in teaching STEM in schools. And um, we had evidence from Dr. Karen Petrie that internet connectivity is an issue in schools, even in urban areas where high quality broadband is available. With the growing importance of technology in STEM learning experiences and the need to increase uptake in computing subjects, the committee has recommended that the government looks at the extent to which this is an issue. And the committee is always very keen to hear directly from teachers about the challenges they face. The value of interdisciplinary work was spoken about by a range of witnesses, including Professor Ian Wall, previously chair of STEMIC. One of our recommendations to look at the extent to which curriculum priorities, such as literacy and numeracy, can be taught through interdisciplinary learning. Blocks of time in primary school dedicated solely to numeracy and literacy can be perceived as a barrier to interdisciplinary learning. And given the need for transferable skills and adaptability to respond to the evolving economy, being able to understand how different disciplines interrelate will be a valuable skill for young people moving into employment and allow them to meet the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution. The inquiry also covered women's representation in STEM. We heard from many inspiring women, including Talit Yaakov, who is director of Equate Scotland, and was yesterday elevated to be a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Talit gave evidence to the committee that challenged preconceived notions about how to improve gender balance. She said it's not about changing what engineering, computing or chemistry are, and it's not about making chemistry about making a perfume kit, which I have seen and rolled, and rolled my eyes at. It's not about changing what science says. Science works the way it works. The difference should be that we should provide spaces in which we can encourage and develop confidence in girls and women. Presenting officer, I believe I'm out. I've reached my time limit. So although I've got many more things to say about this um, experience, can I just thank once again all those who contributed and I move the motion in my name. Uh, and thank you for spotting the worried look in my face, uh, Convener. Can I call on Marie Todd uh, to open for the Scottish Government? Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to the committee for securing the time for this debate because STEM skills have never been more relevant. Embedding STEM skills across the learning journey will be integral to Scotland's future. That's why our STEM education and training strategy is supporting people of all ages to develop their STEM skills. 
We welcomed the input from the committee inquiry into STEM in the early years and we've responded to their recommendations. The committee's report underlines the importance of nurturing STEM skills from the earliest stages in the learning journey. Skills like curiosity in the natural world, investigation, inventiveness and exploration. These are skills that can be nurtured by play-based active learning in ELC and early primary. I have to admit, as a science graduate myself, there is nothing I like more than practicing my pipetting skills at nursery. The expansion of funded early learning and childcare from 600 to 1140 hours in August 2020 will be characterized by precisely this sort of learning. It's a truly transformational investment that brings an important opportunity to enhance early learning and STEM skills. And it's an investment that crucially includes a focus on ensuring that we have a well-trained, skilled workforce with a shared understanding of how children best learn in the early years. It's an investment that also increases access to high quality training resources for that workforce to help deliver the best ELC experience for our children. And that includes access to high quality training and how to support learning in early STEM skills. So members will know that. Certainly. Uh, Tom Mason. Thank you. Um, will the Minister outline what steps they are taking in recognising the STEM work and teaching being undertaken by the armed forces for its cadets in Scotland? Minister Morita. So, um, the basis work with colleges and things, I mean, I don't, I don't really see the relevance of this to early years. We haven't got early years army cadets just yet, but I know that the army cadets work very closely with the colleges and it's a natural fit with all the in interest in outdoors and engineering, it's a natural fit. Members will know that I have been visiting colleges the length and breadth of Scotland and I've seen some wonderful practice at New College Lanarkshire. I was absolutely delighted to join preschoolers doing a rainbow density experiment and lots more practical science led by the stu students at the college. Since the publication of the committee's report, we've launched an online professional learning module on developing skills, knowledge and confidence in develop delivering early learning in STEM. That's the first module to be launched as part of our new programme of continuous professional learning for the sector. And that module is designed to inspire confidence in delivering learning in STEM skills, early STEM skills, and to support the sector to share good practice across Scotland. I launched that module on the 30th of January in a visit to Kings Meadow Nursery in Peebles, which is one of the ELC settings showcased in the module. I saw the most fantastic STEM activities in action, children actively learning outdoors with curiosity and joy about science and STEM and nature. In their recommendations, the Education and Skills Committee on STEM in the early years highlighted the importance of ensuring that training on STEM is accessible to those in private and third sector ELC settings. Our expanded ELC offer is provider neutral, regardless of where children access their offer, whether that's with a local authority, private or voluntary provider, or with a childminder, they can be assured that they are accessing high quality ELC that supports their learning and development. So by ensuring that the new module is free and that it can be accessed remotely and flexibly, we have helped to address barriers to access training for all staff right across the sector. At the last count on Monday morning, the module already had 288 participants and we can see that they're progressing well through the course. 27 learners had already worked their way through the whole module. Feedback from those who've completed has been really positive as well as inspiring play-based approaches to developing children's early learning in STEM, the module will also help to ensure that learning is delivered in a gender neutral way. Children begin to learn about gender roles and expectations from the very early years and quickly pick up messages about what's perceived as normal for girls and boys. They're influenced by their environment and by the adults around them and by gender stereotypes which can place powerful restrictions or what they believe they can achieve in their future as adults. Our national induction resource for the ELC sector also addresses gender neutral practice. 
and that contains some reflective questions, including one on gender-neutral practice, to prompt staff to think about their own values in relation to gender and about how that might influence the way they interact with boys and girls and how they can promote gender equality in their practice. We also recognise the need to diversify the ELC workforce to improve the gender balance. Children pick up these cues about gender roles from observing patterns in the world of work around them, and it's really important that they see more gender balance within the ELC profession. To that end, we've created a £50,000 fund to explore innovative methods of recruiting and retaining males in ELC-related training pro programmes, and we're seeing some progress. It's apprenticeship week, so... In 2018, 97% of those undertaking ELC modern apprenticeships were men, compared to 4% in the workforce. I have to, as I finish, I have to mention our fantastic new practice resource, um, realising the ambition, being me, which, as well as supporting all aspects of ELC practice, sets out how we can support children's development and STEM skills, including digital and learning for sustainability. It's a fantastic resource. The early years are absolutely crucial in setting strong foundations and in harnessing children's natural curiosity. I see them all around when I visit the settings and I am confident about the excellent future of excellent play-based learning and STEM through high quality ELC. Thank you very much, Minister. And I also apologise that there's very little time for uh, interventions and so on in today's debates. I know that all the members are keeping their remarks short. Can I call Graeme, Jamie Green to be followed by Ian Gray? Jamie Green. Uh, thank you. I'd like to start by commending the work of the Education and Skills Committee, which I had the pleasure of joining today for the first time, for producing this uh, report into STEM in early years. And I think let's start with the context of why it's so important that we get STEM right at early years. At the moment, 37% uh, of all Scottish employment is STEM related, and surely that will only rise further in the years to come. But we won't be channeling people into the specialist engineering or tech roles of the future without getting it right now when they are three, four, or five years of age. In fact, one of the first debates that I participated in, starting off, was on digital skills in STEM when I joined the parliament. And then, four years ago, I called on ministers to tackle what I thought were shortcomings in their STEM strategy, particularly around declining teacher numbers. Such was the trend at the time. Well, fast forward four years, and the Parliamentary Committee sums up today my thoughts uh, from then. Uh, lots of good work has been achieved, as we've heard already. Uh, I can point to things like the Young STEM Leaders or My World of Work, uh, the great work of New College Lanarkshire in teacher training, and the Careers Hive at the uh, National Museum Scotland, to name just a few. But arguably, more can and should have been done by government these past four years. Uh, this report concludes several things that I would like to highlight. Let me choose just three. The first being teacher training and resource. By ensuring that there is access to appropriate training for teachers and early years practitioners to equip them, to equip them with what they need to deliver age-appropriate STEM education. The second is about enabling greater access to STEM uh, by tackling some of the gender, ethnic, social and economic imbalances in the take-up of STEM at later stages in life. And three, getting the infrastructure right and that's to physically enable uh, teachers to deliver a truly connected and digital curriculum. Uh, in the short time I have, let me address these three quickly. The first, teacher training and resource. Uh, the report outlined uh, a specific uh, issue of a lack of confidence by many teachers in pursuing STEM-focused activities with children. And that phrase, confidence, crops up a, num a number of times uh, in this report. Uh, in evidence to the uh, committee, Susan Boyd, a teacher from Perth and Kinross, said that even with all the training in the world, schools still need staff to deliver it. She said, I quote, we need to create the resources and then we need to teach them. And we don't have enough bodies on the ground to do that effectively. STEM can't just be one teacher's passion. It has to be everybody's. It has to be every teacher that can deliver this to a really high quality all the time. I couldn't put it better myself. When teachers were asked to uh, rate their levels of confidence in STEM disciplines, 50% uh, said maths, 45% science, but only 3% said engineering, and only 2% said technology. These aren't new findings or significant revelations for us. We knew back in 2017 with the government's own STEM strategy that uh, they acknowledged that it would require excellence in the education offered at early years and that more interventions were needed at a younger years. Uh, the other point around enabling greater access, 
Uh, we know that STEM disengagement begins as early as around six years of age. We know we have a problem in getting more girls and BAME students into STEM, so it's, more, it's absolutely vital that we get them interested at an early age. It is so important that at every level of education, we encourage and inspire enthusiasm into STEM across gender, race, and social backgrounds. Because science and technology is something that everyone and anyone can get excited about, and it should have no boundaries when it comes to participation. My final point is that of infrastructure and connectivity. Because before we tackle digital innovation, we need to make sure that every school has universal access to what they need to teach. Adequate broadband, hardware, and technical support, be they rural, urban, city, or island schools. Uh, my colleague uh, will touch more on that. So what would we like to see in closing? Uh, I think there's a sensible debate we had around uh, STEM bursaries with a specific purpose of increasing uh, teacher numbers in these subjects. On early years, the expansion of early years rollout that we've talked about in this chamber must be delivered sustainably and actually deliver better early year STEM teaching. On digital infrastructure, we must get that right in nurseries and schools. But more importantly, STEM, I think, must sit really at the heart of the curriculum from early years right through, because STEM both enables and assists us to get the other basics right. Core subjects can hang off the back of it. Teachers can get excited about it. Children can be inspired by it. Because presenting officer then and only then can we be sure of giving young people the very best start possible in the economies of the future. If we get it right now, it will pay off later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reader. Call Ian Gray to be followed by Ross Greer. Ian Gray. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Officer. This is uh, a welcome debate. It takes place, of course, in the context of, I think, widespread consensus of the importance uh, of uh, improving STEM education and the, the number of young people uh, who choose STEM as a path for study and then for their careers. Uh, we've already heard some examples, but we know that uh, in the years to come, we need uh, thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of uh, STEM-based professionals new to their professions uh, in order to meet the skills demands uh, of our economy. We also uh, know, and I think this is widely agreed too, uh, that we have to start young. Uh, the Learned Societies Group, in their submission uh, to the, the committee report, talked about science capital and pointed out that students with low science capital who do not express STEM-related aspirations by age 10 are unlikely to develop such aspirations as they get older. And anyone uh, uh, who, as I have, has taught science in secondary schools will know that those pupils who decide science is not for them will have decided long before they get uh, into secondary school. And that's why the committee, of course, focused uh, on early years and primary. We'll, we'll hear a lot, already have, about the report itself, but um, I wanted to try and illustrate some of the challenges that we identified through an experience of my own. Uh, a couple of years ago, <clears throat> a large primary school in my constituency uh, asked me to go into school and do a science lesson with Primary 7 uh, to mark Science Week. So, uh, never uh, one to uh, uh, avoid the chance to get back into the classroom. Uh, I agreed, uh, went in and undertook an experiment there to uh, measure the speed of light uh, using chocolate buttons and the old microwave from the staff room. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I had a great time, but it really, uh, 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 when I think about that experience, it does illustrate a number of the problems that the report uh, looked at. Firstly, teacher confidence. In this instance, uh, they had to ask someone or they felt that it was right to ask someone who had once in the distant past been a science teacher in a secondary school to come in and deliver a science lesson in a primary school. They should have been much better placed, in fact, to do that than me, but didn't have the, the confidence. Secondly, it was a one-off, a special occasion. It was to mark uh, science week, all of primary seven were marched into the hall, uh, so it was certainly not just a normal uh, Friday morning uh, in the school. And finally, I was the only one that got to play with the microwave and certainly the only one that got anywhere near the chocolate buttons. <laughs> and uh, because, of course, the school doesn't have the resources so that individual pupils can experience doing experiments uh, for themselves. These are all 
some of the problems which we identified in the committee report. On the plus side, um, uh, working with such young pupils, and my own previous professional experience having been with older young people, the enthusiasm of those young people for the science was tremendous, and the enthusiasm was just as evident amongst the girls uh, as the boys. And it was an experiment, I say to the convener, which was real science. It was not dumbed down in any way or tried to be made suitable for children or for, well, hopefully it was appropriate for children, uh, but not in the way that she described in the chemistry experiment uh, 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 being about making perfume or any of that. So there were positives about it as well. But the long and the short, I think, is that the recommendations of the committee are that really we need to do an awful lot better when it comes to STEM education in primary schools than getting somebody like me in with a microwave uh, to do that kind of experiment. We need teachers to be confident. We need STEM teaching to be consistent and embedded in the curriculum. And we need it to be participative so that all the young people get the experience of proper hands-on experimental science. And only then will we get the step change this report demands and in fairness, the government's STEM education strategy seeks as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Greer. Call on Ross Greer to be followed by Beatrice Wishart. Ross Greer. Thank you. Uh, science, technology, engineering and mathematics have been at the heart of Scotland's historical success as a nation. Our world-leading expertise and skills base were integral to our status as a global hub of manufacturing and as a home to many great scientific achievements and advancements. And knowledge and expertise in those same fields is key to tackling the climate crisis that we face today by, for example, embracing a Green New Deal, seizing the advantage of our abundant capacity for renewables and reindustrialization as a center for green manufacturing. But at the moment, that potential isn't being harnessed in the way it could be. The government's STEM strategy does go some way to addressing that. I think it is broadly welcomed and was broadly welcomed across this chamber when it was published. But it can only do so much because it's a supply side measure aimed at providing the skills and the workforce. But without clear government strategy directing investment into the economic strategy to go alongside it, without a real industrial strategy, there will not be enough jobs for those skills. And this isn't something that the market will simply provide given the right input of skills and people. The government cannot allow the STEM strategy to stand in isolation or to presume something like the innovation strategies, though they are welcome as well, are adequate economic plans to sit alongside it. Whilst I urge the government to consider this, how education and economic strategies can come together, there's clearly still substantial work to be done around the STEM strategy itself, as the committee found. There continues to be gender imbalance in STEM subjects, uh, gender stereotypes that we see uh, that result in women being underrepresented are established by the time that children reach school age. After the age of about seven, all the evidence that we were provided with shows that we're simply undoing the damage of expectations which have already been set. So emphasis on the early years is absolutely essential. Not just to inspire and enthuse children about STEM, but to tackle the often unconscious biases of parents, carers, teachers and other staff, as well as portrayals in popular culture and the media, including the gendered uh, advertising of toys. Campaigns like Let Toys Be Toys have been doing great work here, particularly with STEM toys, and I'd encourage the government to work with them and others in this area. We need to ensure that everyone who engages with children is aware of how gender stereotypes manifest, how their own actions and expectations, whether conscious or unconscious, impact on children and change their expectations of themselves and of society as a whole. That means making sure that sufficient training is available to early years practitioners and to teachers, and that they have the time to engage with this training. One common theme of the committee's inquiries mentioned by Jamie Green was a lack of confidence amongst early year staff and primary teachers when it comes to delivering STEM education. This is particularly acute in engineering and technology. But it doesn't necessarily mean a lack of ability or knowledge. In fact, in some cases, it clearly did not mean that. Teachers had both the ability and the knowledge. So ensuring that training is tackling the specific issue of confidence amongst the teaching and early years workforce will be critical. In early years, I don't think this can be separated from the issue of access to nursery teachers. Early years practitioners are trained to a high standard, but ensuring that all children do genuinely have access to a qualified nursery teacher does not just benefit them, it benefits other early years staff as well. But we know in practice that often too many, for too many children, 
access to a nursery teacher is nothing more than that teacher traveling between a number of early year centers to meet with staff without having direct involvement in the delivery of education, or even in many cases without the time to deliver training to early year staff in areas like STEM. Like every other area of training that we've come across during committee inquiries, effective STEM training has to take place across both initial teacher education and continuous professional development. So I hope that we'll have the opportunity to consider this during our upcoming ITE inquiry. The committee also heard how deprivation, unsurprisingly, impacts on STEM in early years. Activities that promote STEM tend to cost a bit more, whether it's more resource intensive practical experiments like what Ian Gray mentioned, or traveling to events. Many schools rely on parent and carer donations to fund these, which inevitably disadvantages more deprived communities. This is compounded in deprived rural communities where more travel means greater expense. So the evidence provided by Glasgow Science Centre in particular on their roadshow programme, taking their offer directly to schools is very welcome, though we clearly can't rely on the likes of the Science Centre getting everywhere. There are clear lessons to be learned from the committee's inquiry. I welcome the government's commitment to much of the, many of the conclusions that we made. And I look forward, like members across this chamber, to working with the government to take forward the STEM agenda that we all have for Scotland. Thank you, Mr Greer. And can I call Beatrice Wishart? Thank you, Presiding Officer. And could I echo Claire Adamson's thanks to the committee clerks and contributors, all the contributors to the inquiry. I intended to start with a quote, but Ian Gray has beat me to it. But on the other hand, it is quite important. I think I will I'll read it out again. Students with low science capital who do not express STEM-related aspirations by age 10 are unlikely to develop such aspirations as they get older. The importance of this debate on the Education Committee's report into STEM and early years education is captured by that finding from the Learned Societies Group. It's crucial to develop curiosity in the early years to foster a lifelong interest in science and technology. A number of important issues were discussed over the course of the committee inquiry. I'll focus on just one here. There is a desire amongst early, learning te early years teachers to improve their confidence and practice in teaching STEM. I recognize that there's some good uptake of continuous professional development courses across the country and that there is a good collaboration with businesses in their briefing ahead of this debate, BT described their Young Engineers and Science Club programme to support learners aged 3 to 18, and their Barefoot Computing programme, which has teachers from 75% of schools signed up. However, for many practitioners, the desire to upskill is not always met with the ability to take up places on courses. This is a systemic issue that needs to be addressed. Simply pointing out all the courses that are available makes no difference if teachers aren't able to go on them. The committee had worrying evidence from the Scottish School Education Research Centre that one local authority had put a blanket ban on anybody travelling to professional learning out with that local authority. I think it's important to find out whether there is any justification for that. One important factor preventing uptake is workload. An OECD report published last September confirmed that Scotland's teachers work some of the longest hours in the world. With teachers spending so much of their time in front of the class, they don't have time for personal development that helps them continue improving as teachers. It's no wonder that one attendee of the Education Committee's workshop at the Scottish Learning Festival said, the root of many issues is class contact time. If you want teachers to engage with the CPD necessary to deliver high quality STEM education, you have to give them time. So it's disappointing that workload is not specifically being considered by the OECD in its review of curriculum for excellence, despite the Scottish Liberal Democrat call for that to be included. I remain concerned about the ability of private and third sector ELC staff to access STEM training. In the Chamber earlier this week, we discussed the importance of quality early learning and childcare. There is good work being done. The Scottish Childminding Association is working hard to promote STEM to its members. But perhaps the Minister could indicate what measures are being developed to help uptake amongst the wider ELC workforce. To conclude, Presiding Officer, Scotland has strong STEM amb ambitions for our pupils and our economy, and rightly so, but we need to get some of the basics right to make that happen. Thank you very much, Ms. Bishop. And we move to the open part of the debate. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Liz Smith. Rona Mackay. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be speaking in this important committee debate on STEM and early years education. It's vital that as a nation we promote the value of having fully inclusive STEM education and I'm pleased that the committee undertook this thorough inquiry. Can I start by addressing the acronym STEM, meaning science, technology, engineering and mathematics? Um, these are vital standalone subjects, equally important, which should perhaps not be put together as one entity. As our report states, this can present one overall confidence level that can mask the low levels of confidence we encountered in some aspects of teaching, engineering and technology. One witness, Lorna Hay, a primary school teacher, emphasised the importance of ensuring that teacher confidence in STEM is considered in its constituent parts. She said, you'll probably find the majority of teachers are very confident about teaching maths and possibly about science and basic information and communication technology, but they're not confident at all about teaching computer science and engineering. So the committee port report produced some clear recommendations, namely that we must improve access to professional training to increase teacher and early years practitioner confidence, especially in the areas of technology and engineering. So I was pleased to hear from the Minister uh, in her opening speech of the progress that, that's been made in this regard. And I'd also like to note the collaborative work being done by further education institutions and their willingness to be part of a wider learning strategy. For example, a module developed in partnership with the University of the West of Scotland is the first in a suite of three continuous professional learning modules being rolled out as part of the drive to increase the quality of early learning and childcare services. Another finding was that we must improve, improve access to adequate internet connectivity and technology to support STEM learning generally, but particularly in remote and rural areas. Presiding officer, the area that I focused my questions on during the excellent evidence sessions we heard from a variety of witnesses was, was that of gender discrimination and gender stereotyping. This is where there needs to be a focus on long-term interventions in school and early learning settings when the government is measuring progress in the STEM strategy aims. It could take the form of regional improvement collaborative map mapping cluster work between early learning and childcare settings in primary schools, as well as mapping collaborative work between primary and secondary schools. Presiding officer, we need to measure tangible progress in this area. It's vital that girls are not hampered by stereotyping and that they're encouraged to participate uh, in, in, and excel in all aspects of STEM subjects. The committee did hear of encouraging work in this area from early years practitioners. Most said that the emphasis was not put on girls' play or boys' play and learning and that children were encouraged to participate in any activity that they wanted. Indeed, much of the play activity incorporated all aspects of STEM learning in an informal, enjoyable way for children. But it was acknowledged that gender stereotyping often starts at home and it was sometimes difficult to encourage new habits and interests during learning when it wasn't being encouraged at home. The committee's um, initial work heard that the ch children's perceptions of what type of uh, job they can uh, perform can be defined as early as at the age of six, as the convener said. So tackling equity gaps means we must tackle conscious and unconscious bias if we're ever to give our girls the best start in life. Um, presiding officer, is definitely not all gloom and doom. There are good things happening and encouraging progress being made. In my constituency in Eastern Bartonshire, Miller's Nuke Primary School as a working group devoted to building the science curriculum where teachers were given the freedom to plan lessons so they could deliver science, either as a distinct subject or part of an interdisciplinary experience. That resulted in greater, a greater degree of professional learning, increased staff confidence, and learners engaged in better planned and structured uh, investigative and collaborative learning experiences. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I am optimistic that we're on the right trajectory when it comes to STEM learning, but there is work to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Mackay. I call Liz Smith to be followed by Alistair Allen. Uh, thank you. And can I begin by thanking my former colleagues on the Education and Skills Committee for the, un the work that they undertook and also pay tribute to Claire Adamson because I know this is an issue that is very close to your heart, convener. Uh, like other uh, longer serving members of this parliament, I'm very conscious that despite uh, the STEM issues having been very much on our agenda for a very long period of time, we have not yet made the significant progress that we want and that our young people deserve. How often have we said that there will be transformational developments in this area? How often have we said that we have to create the right educational, intellectual, long-term job opportunities for all ages? And how often have we said that it is from the earliest ages that our young people should feel inspired? Seeking solutions, pushing boundaries, asking questions, inquiring about the way that things work, 
and taking full advantage, obviously, of all the things that we can teach them in science, technology, engineering and mathematics. From all the evidence that we've heard over several years, there are some really key issues. The most important of which, as far as I'm concerned, is the quality of science teaching in the early years. Members know that I have very long been an advocate of the dedicated science teachers in primary school following the strong evidence that was submitted to us by the Royal Society of Chemistry some years ago. I was and I remain very persuaded of the unquestionable benefits of specialists in the classroom whose ability to create that first spark of science enthusiasm can do so much to put our young people on the right road. And I fully understand why the government talks about the broad curriculum, cross-curricular subject learning in the Curriculum for Excellence, but I think there are strong reasons for trying to increase the number of dedicated science teachers in our primary schools. This is because I think it's very important that young children can start learning to, to think in specific ways that help them to engage with an increasingly technological and digital world. Furthermore, without changes to the structure of training and teaching, I do not think it will be easy to develop the appropriate career tra trajectory for STEM teachers. That innate attraction to the job and the impact that they can have in the classroom. This government has poured vast sums of money and focus into STEM, and while that's a very welcome development, changes to the framework of training are crucial, and I hope that's something that will come through uh, the committee's investigation into teacher training. The Scottish Government is absolutely right to argue that local authorities must have autonomy in managing funding, but just as be been the case in music tuition, there are clearly issues about resource provision especially from those from the more disadvantaged backgrounds. For example, on a recent visit to the Rosalind Institute, I was told that a number of local authorities had been unable to afford the bus hire to get their pupils to what was quite clearly one of the best and most imaginative school science visits I've ever seen. That is a big worry, and I agree with the Learned Societies group when they say that they should be collecting more data about who it is that's having to bear the brunt of the cost of science education. Looking back at all the Scottish Government commissioned reports into STEM, and there are several of them, the good intentions are there for everybody to see, as are the ambitions about what needs to happen to ensure that our young people have a better STEM experience. These ambitions are not the problem. Changing attitude is a different story. And if there is one lesson from the committee's work, it is the essential need to break away from the constraints which seem so constant when it comes to STEM education. As I leave the committee, May I suggest we need to better coherence between what the science experts are telling us, what teacher training programmes involve, and what local authorities can commit to when it comes to dedicated science teachers in our primary schools. A big job, but a very important one. Thank you very much. And can I call Alistair Allen to be followed by Mary Fee. Presenting officer, um, as we've heard, the Education Committee took extensive evidence and recognised the growing seriousness with which schools across Scotland take STEM in the early years. Scotland can only flourish, of course, as a science nation if science is embedded in education from the earliest stage, and there is much across Scotland's education system uh, which seeks to do just that. So it's only right that we do take an opportunity to celebrate that. I've been delighted to see some of the positive steps um, that have been undertaken in recent years. We've made STEM education a clear priority in Scotland, uh, emphasising the importance of numeracy and mathematics education, lessons in the natural sciences, as well as others have alluded to, alluded to uh, coding and uh, technological understanding for uh, the early years. We're doing all of that by putting millions of pounds towards boosting STEM education and encouraging people to pursue STEMs in uh, early year, to, to pursue STEM careers. Um, and we're putting uh, these funds towards promoting the programmes of our partner organisations and supporting uh, STEM educator training. And indeed, we're seeing some results with year-to-year with -year, uh, percentage increases in important metrics such as uh, Scottish STEM educator training entrance and female scientific apprenticeship participation. However, one reason, certainly not the only reason for the report, uh, relates to the wide understanding uh, shared among teachers of the need to overcome continuing barriers uh, to girls taking up careers uh, as young women in STEM. Uh, and as Claire Adamson uh, mentioned, we do still have to tackle lingering perceptions gained at a very early age about whether or not science is for girls. Research has identified that children as young as six report gender differences in relation to levels of interest, confidence, uh, and self-efficacy uh, regarding STEM learning. 
And with all of that in mind, uh, the report recommends that uh, the Improving Gender Balance and Equalities Programme monitor its capacity to provide support that can reach schools and early learning settings. It recommends, too, that the Scottish Government develop a, a means of measuring tangible progress in schools and early year settings in relation to gender balance regarding its STEM initiatives. Now, closely related to all of those aims uh, is the need to ensure that teachers themselves have a confidence about teaching STEM subjects in the early years. Uh, and as alluded to by Rona Mackay, while 63% of teachers uh, say that they were confident in teaching STEM subjects overall, uh, their confidence levels became more complicated when the actual component subjects of STEM are separated out. So at the Scottish Learning Festival workshop, teachers and early years practitioners were asked, which element of STEM do you feel most confident in? 45% said science, 2% said technology, 3% engineering, 50% maths. Education Scotland's £1.4 million STEM professional learning grants are clearly a step intended to address some of these issues. Education Scotland themselves said the technology side clearly needs uh, more support, especially engineering, but we also still, have to, have also still have work to do in terms of mathematics and numeracy. And that's why the second round of the grants programme uh, which was launched last week, continues to have an extremely strong focus on mathematics and numeracy. Now, there is, I suspect, a shared understanding between the committee and the government of the need to address all these matters through emphasising these subject areas in future, enhancing professional learning grants and an initial teacher education. The government has already responded to these committee recommendations, uh, and I would welcome the positive tone of that response. So to conclude, presiding officer, uh, I believe this is a, a constructive report uh, and one which has likewise received uh, a constructive response from the government. Thank you very much, Mr. Allen. And I call Mary Fee to be followed by Willie Coffey. Mary Fee. Thank you, presiding officer. And can I begin by thanking the Education and Skills Committee for, they, for the work they've done in STEM education. And the inquiry and subsequent report shows the scale of the challenge ahead. And I hope that the committee will continue to press the government to take the necessary steps to address the issues and improve the equity and availability of STEM education. And I welcome the recommendations and conclusions drawn from the inquiry. The 22 recommendations, which are all evidence-based, must be accepted by um, and actioned by the, the government. And STEM should be at the heart of the education system and equal to the focus that's placed on literacy and numeracy. And it should be introduced as early in the curriculum as possible. And I am pleased that the government agree with that and are creating more opportunities for children to learn through STEM from the age of three. However, as we learn through the inquiry, such opportunities are not always afforded to all children because of gender bias, poverty, geography, and resources available in the education setting and for the teacher or practitioner. And before I address some of those issues, I want to address some of the points identified in relation to teacher and early years practitioner confidence. And I do believe that increasing the confidence and the ability of primary teachers and those in childcare settings will help to tackle some of the problems that are systemic in STEM education. And the committee, as highlighted by many throughout the inquiry, has recommended that confidence levels should be expressed over the four individual disciplines of STEM. And this is an absolute must if the government wants to target resources at particular disciplines of concern, which, as the report highlights, are engineering and technology. And, presiding officer, gender bias and stereotypes must be eradicated if we are to see real change in gender equality, and that extends to STEM education. Children as young as six are aware of gender differences, and that should not be happening. All children should have access to the same educational opportunities and equity in their career paths. And the report tells us that a whole school or whole early learning and childcare approach is key to countering the ingrained pattern of early stereotypes limiting people's aspirations and informing future career decisions and attitudes. And, presiding officer, the inquiry shows that deprivation is a major barrier to delivering and improving STEM education. 
and we know that resources in schools have been scaled back over the last decade. We know that teachers are buying resources. We know that parents are being asked to help fund, fund classroom resources. And the SNP are quick to take credit, yet when cuts to local councils have been sustained for over a decade, resulting in teachers and parents funding STEM activities, they are quick to absol absolve themselves of any responsibility. And a range of witnesses gave evidence to the committee that the lack of so-called STEM capital is creating more barriers for children. Asking parents to help fund classroom, classrooms adds further pressure on those from the poorest backgrounds, compounding the financial stresses that many parents face every day. And the government should, without hesitation, accept and action all of the recommendations on deprivation and gender. And presiding officer, we all want Scotland to be the best place for children to learn and grow. The role of science, technology, engineering and maths are crucial in creating the jobs of the future, jobs that are sustainable and help the lives and opportunities of everyone. And in conclusion, can I thank the committee again for their valuable report and I hope we do see real action from the government to meet the many challenges the report highlights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fee. And can I call Willie Coffey before we move to closing speeches? Willie Coffey. Thanks very much. <coughs> President Officer, I'm not a member of the committee, but I take a keen interest in STEM whenever the opportunity arises. Uh, the committee and those providing evidence are to be congratulated for this piece of work, and in many ways it reinforces some of the issues that have been around for a while. The report probably hits the nail on the head at the outset when it talks about confidence within the profession, within the four key areas in STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths. And when separated out, as one or two other members have mentioned, we see a different picture emerging in terms of confidence levels in science and maths when compared to technology and engineering. Uh, it was Lorna Hay mentioned in the report who highlighted this, and it seems to be supported by others who contributed that confidence isn't so high when it comes to teaching computer science and engineering. The surprising thing about this for me is that anyone is actually surprised at it. It's been an issue for such a long time and regularly features as a discussion point when computing in the curriculum is mentioned. How do we train our teachers <coughs> and early years practitioners about the wonders of computing and the possibilities it can open up for our children and for them too in the digital world that we live in? I'm pleased to see that the Scottish Government is aware of this and taking action by way of the STEM professional learning grants, which seek to help about 14,000 practitioners this year. But how will we know if it's working? Clearly, we'll have to see confidence levels improving, but I hope we can look further than this and see how it impacts on the children and the young people themselves, whether they become more enthused with STEM to such an extent that they feel they want to stick with it in later years, and particularly the girls. Sure, sure. Me Green. Can I just ask, uh, I know the members, this is a subject of great interest to them, but can I ask why, therefore, if it's been such a big issue for such a long time, why, it's, why it is still such a big issue? Really cough. <laughs> I, th I think it's, I'll, I'll just come on to that. I think there are social and cultural issues about this too, and some of the members have mentioned that it sets in at a very early age, and we need to do more to intervene at a much more earlier age to try and turn this round. Um, I hope I'm not over-dramatising the issue, presiding officer, but I think it's crucial that we provide that confidence and thereby give our teachers and early years staff the ability to enthuse our, youngers to our youngsters to such an extent that they see STEM as a fantastic option with great opportunities for the future. Now, on the gender imbalance issue that's of concern to a number of members, uh, what more is there for us to learn about this? The committee correctly focused in on it to bring the issue to our attention once again. Now, only a few weeks ago, presiding officer, I welcomed a group of school students from Dundee to the parliament, all of whom were really bright and enthusiastic about developing a career in software development. But all of them were males. Not a single female was amongst them. We know the social and cultural issues are, are there, stereotyping issues where science is for the boys, engineering and oily rag pursuits are also only for the boys. And we know we have to keep working at this. That's why I had to laugh at the, co the comments that were mentioned by the convener from Talat Yacoub and Tony Scullion, who lamented that they'd seen an attempt to make chemistry attractive to females by demonstrating how to make perfume. As, as usual, presiding officer, I'm indebted to East Ayrshire Council for providing me with a little bit of insight into the STEM agenda there. In all of the early childhood centres there, the children get to engage with STEM experiences, both indoors in the class and increasingly outdoors too. 
Community engagement is working well there with local STEM ambassadors from Spirit Aero Systems being involved. So there's lots to be proud of right across all of the communities in East Ayrshire. Uh, in conclusion, in this short debate, President Officer, the committee is to be congratulated for this wide-ranging and thought thoughtful report. It touches on the many issues that we face on confidence building, resourcing, equality of access and the continuing issue of attracting females into science. There are some really good initiatives taking place and put in place by the Scottish Government and some really good practice in East Ayrshire too. And as ever, a welcome acknowledgement that there's much more work to do to take the STEM agenda forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we move now to closing speeches. Carl Ian Gray. Thank you, President Officer. As one would expect uh, this afternoon, we've heard a, a fair bit about all the issues uh, the committee report identified, the challenges in improving STEM education and learning in early years and primary schools. Heard too about uh, the driver for that, the need for that, about the need for uh, skills for the future, for what uh, I know the committee convener always likes to call the fourth industrial revolution, um, uh, those uh, STEM-based uh, industries which will create the prosperity that we need to see uh, in the future. One example of that is the, the briefing which was provided to us today from BT, which tells us that the tech sector needs 13,000 new skilled professionals each year. Uh, and if we're going to come anywhere close to meeting that demand, then the truth is we're going to have to do something different and soon. Uh, and that BT briefing is a case in point, I think, because it also tells us about very significant resources being developed by BT to support the teaching of STEM in our primary schools. And that is really, really good. But the problem is that we cannot leave something as important as this to the efforts of a private company like BT. Of, of course, it is incumbent on companies like BT who need those STEM skills to play their part in making that possible. But it cannot be the foundation of STEM learning, which really has to be, and we've heard this from many speakers, has to be consistent uh, across the board. And that, that's true as well of things like the Young Engineers and Science Clubs program run by STDI or the, the STEM ambassadors or the Young Engineers with Scottish Engineering run uh, or indeed the work that Ross Greer talked about that the science centres do. All of these are first class but all too randomly dependent on an enthusiastic teacher to run, and run them and engage with them and on local enterprises being there to engage with the schools or indeed dependent on access to those facilities which of course are much, much less likely to prove possible uh, for schools in rural areas uh, or very small schools. No, this does come back primarily to ensuring that all primary teachers have confidence in teaching STEM. That uh, 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 Learned Societies uh, group evidence says quite clearly, teacher expertise has the greatest effect on student achievement. And that is one of the reasons, of course, that the committee's next major report is into initial teacher education. But the truth is that we don't even know the scale of the problem here, uh, because as uh, Willie Coffey referred to and Mary Fee uh, did as well, uh, uh, surveying confidence in STEM actually hides the problem because often high levels of confidence in maths teaching mask very low levels of confidence in teaching science and uh, engineering. So the government, and this is an easy thing they could do, needs to start collecting that baseline information in a disaggregated way uh, in future. And of course, it isn't just about initial teacher education, but also about uh, continuing professional development, as Ross Greer uh, spoke about. And the committee, uh, for example, heard that CERC, uh, who I know the convener uh, is involved with, uh, an excellent organisation and already providing high quality training for primary teachers in STEM teaching. Something which they would like to do for more, indeed for all primary teachers. How disappointing then that CERC responded to the committee report by saying that discussions with the Scottish Government about making this programme more comprehensive have not been positive and that funding is not forthcoming for the expansion uh, of their activities. And I know some members groan, but Mary Fee is right. If we want progress in this area, we are not going to get it unless we are prepared to pay for it. Presiding officer, this is the crux of the issue. Liz Smith 
was right when she said that we, we really know all this and we know much of what we have to do. We just aren't doing it fast enough. The committee heard from Professor Ian Wall how previous reports he'd been involved in, for example, by the STEMEC committee, have made similar recommendations to the committees in the past, but government has just not progressed those recommendations with the urgency, consistency or investment required. If we are serious about creating opportunity for our young people in the tech sector, and if we're serious about investing in the future economic prosperity of our country, that has to change, and it has to change now. Thank you. I call Jimmy Halker Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. We've heard many times in this chamber and much today about the importance of encouraging and promoting STEM education, particularly to our youngest generations. But what today's debate shows is that a truly lifelong approach to STEM learning is required, a radical change in how we promote and deliver skills in this country. Of course, things are by no means bleak. Over many years, decades, in fact, there have been numerous initiatives from schools, charity, charities and volunteers, from even national institutions like the BBC, the Royal Society and even Edinburgh festivals, and initiatives that have fired the imagination of young people in STEM fields. Many will remember their first glimpses of new technology or their first chemistry experiment. And it was often an event where horizons were opened. It was, a, it was where world and its building blocks suddenly became real. And every day somehow, uh, the everyday somehow becomes special. The challenge to us and to educators and parents is to open our youngest children's eyes to the incredible range of possibilities and opportunities available to them. I've previously um, raised the importance of careers guidance at all stages of a child and young person's life. We know in STEM, but in other areas too, that early impressions of jobs and work can stick. Very young children can st still identify certain careers as being for men or women, as others, to others today have mentioned. Once established, these impressions can be difficult to break. And we see significant gender divides throughout schooling, in universities and apprenticeships, and inevitably into careers as well. I will, though, just say that I was delighted to meet uh, two modern apprentices earlier today who were, were female modern apprentices who were working <coughs> in the automotive engineering and the construction sector, so there are obviously exceptions. As a new member of the Education and Skills Committee, I unfortunately did not have the opportunity to participate in the inquiry into STEM in the early years that reported in November. The report itself is a serious and well-considered piece of work, and some of the concerns it raises will not be straightforward to address. As Jamie Green and Ross Greer highlighted, among teachers and early years practitioners, there are questions over their confidence in delivering age-appropriate STEM teaching and the initial training they receive. STEM is, of course, a generalization, and as technology enters so many of our lives, an increasingly imprecise one. The breadth of, a STEM field mean, uh, the, of the STEM field means that it becomes a question of priorities. What knowledge do we emphasize? What do we signpost and when? The committee has touched on some of these underlying issues in its recommendations. In relation to early years practitioners, this will be even more important as the provision of funded childcare rolls out and new entrants are increasingly required. As I mentioned briefly, STEM is by nature evolving. And so it is important the resource and the flexibility is available to provide continuing training and development for teachers and early years practitioners in the future. We can also look to the questions around knowledge sharing, collaboration and interdisciplinary learning. As the Highlands and Islands MSP, I also want to talk uh, briefly about the committee's conclusions around remote and rural uh, areas. Many local authorities in my region particularly, by necessity, are using learning technology in innovative and impressive ways. But equally, many suffer poor connectivity and a central belt bias where innovation is brought from outside. That must be addressed. Central initiatives clearly shouldn't stop in the central belt. Um, there have been a number of very good contributions from around the chamber, and I'm sorry that I haven't got time to cover all of them, but I did want to cover very briefly, mention a few. My colleague Jamie Gree spoke uh, about STEM being at the heart of, of the curriculum going forward. Ian Gray uh, spoke about his own experience, and I'm sure I'm not the only one here who wants to learn uh, how he demonstrates the speed of light with a microwave and uh, chocolate buttons. Um, Liz Smith uh, talked about the resources going into STEM, but also that we've not made uh, the progress that needs to be made, in, uh, and she highlighted obviously the need for dedicated science teachers in primary schools, which is something she's spoken about, I know, before. Presiding officer, this has been a considered debate uh, on a very important subject. But more than that, it's, a posit it's positive that we are having this debate and that this parliament is pushing forward STEM, even in less obvious areas of our education and skills landscape. It is vital for our young people and it is vital for their futures that we get it right.
Thank you very much. And I call on Richard Lockhead to conclude for the Government. I too welcome this debate and wish to congratulate the committee and all the members and everyone who gave evidence on what is a very important subject uh, and a challenge facing our country. And I also want to pay tribute to all the practitioners in STEM across the country. I think many of us have the opportunity to visit local schools and early year settings and colleges and universities and can witness ourselves the really good work that's taking place across Scotland thanks to the input from very enthusiastic people who support uh, the STEM agenda and of course pay tribute to the enthusiastic children uh, and young people that Ian Gray referred to uh, as well. Uh, I've had the opportunity to visit many local schools just in the last few months in my own constituency and early year settings and it really is a sight to behold to see how enthusiastic young people are about STEM activities. The government is very committed to ensuring we do have a highly skilled and educated population equipped with the STEM knowledge and capability required to adapt and thrive in this fast-paced fast changing world and economy that is around us. We all accept in this debate, as we have done, that STEM skills are more relevant than ever before, as we face, for instance, as highlighted by Ross Greer, the global climate emergency, to name one big challenge facing us all. And they will drive the creativity and innovation that Scotland will need to thrive in the global marketplace and enable us to meet the challenges arising from other challenges, such as the UK's exit to the European Union as well. As many members have said, all the evidence points to need to start engagement with STEM early. As the committee report says, children's perceptions of who can do what kind of job forms at an early age of perhaps six or seven. And we want to tackle ingrained gender disparity, which again many members have mentioned. In the workforce, we need to start young. Learning in mathematics, science and technology is progressive. It needs to be built on each stage of education. So the earlier young people can start to get to grips with the concepts and principles of these subjects, the better. And that is why CERC, the Scottish Schools Education Research Centre, which has been referred to by many members, uh, and their science and technology programme for primary teachers has been funded for many, many years by successive administrations uh, and the Parliament. And I will publish the second STEM strategy annual report uh, only next week, which I'm sure you'll all pay attention to, uh, the second annual report of that five-year strategy, and that will show how we are making progress uh, with this important uh, agenda. If I can turn to some of the issues mentioned by members and the report, uh, I can say that I'm, of course, pleased that the committee found high levels of commitment to and enthusiasm for STEM in our schools and their early year settings, and acknowledge the amount of innovation currently underway across the country in relation to STEM. Now, of course, the committee said, and I agree with this, that this must be consolidated and we must make sure that everyone, everywhere benefits, and I couldn't agree more. And I know that uh, Jamie Halper johnson just mentioned the need to make sure we're reaching out to remote and rural communities. And I should mention there's a number of ways in which that is happening just now. Some of the, or a fair proportion of the grants go to uh, rural uh, settings for professional development for practitioners and schools and early year settings. And also the Scottish Science Centres, which the Scottish Government Fund, have specific outreach programmes for rural and remote communities uh, and public transport subsidies, for instance, to make sure the schools and others can pay for the bus travel and so on and so forth. In terms of teachers, uh, which I know a number of members mentioned, we are, of course, continuing to introduce more, more bursaries for career changers so they can, we can have more STEM teachers uh, in the system. We had 108 such bursaries in 2018-19. We had 111 in 2019-20. And shortly, the Scottish Government will be announcing in the next uh, couple of weeks uh, the next round of bursaries uh, as well. Also, the, the made professional learning and STEM grants of nearly £2 million have assisted educational practitioners, as I said just a minute ago, in all parts of Scotland, involving more than 700 educational establishments and nearly 14,000 practitioners uh, this year alone. Uh, continued support for raising aspirations in science, known as RAISE, the Primary Science Development Programme, uh, again is moving forward, and we've got the CERT Primary Cluster Mentoring Programme at the same time. We also have the STEM advisors working with Education Scotland. Uh, they are dedicated to supporting STEM education in each of the six regional improvement collaboratives, 
working alongside advisors specialising in mathematics and digital skills. And digital skills, again, is an issue highlighted by many members uh, as well. And in terms of improving gender balance uh, and equalities, we, of course, have a specific initiative dedicated to that. Uh, we have taken action to raise awareness of gender bias with, bias with parents, families and teachers at all stages of the education process. Uh, we want to build on that and up to December 2019, Education Scotland's Improving Gender Balance and Equality Officers engaged with 50 school clusters and had over 2,200 engagements with practitioners as well. There's a lot more happening as well I could talk about in terms of, of that particular agenda, but there's a lot happening and we will continue to build upon that. It was mentioned that we should be Time giving conclude, more funding Minister, to, to CERC. Uh, I can say that their activity is going to expand across the country. It's not contracting, it's actually expanding. So there's a lot happening at all stages of the process so we can transform Scotland into a STEM nation. We are going in the right direction, there's a lot more to do, and we welcome the, the report from the committee, which gives more signposts of how we can make things even better. Thank you very much, Minister. And can I call on Daniel Johnson as Deputy Convener to conclude our debate this afternoon? I, uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm very mindful that decision time is scheduled for half past, so I'll attempt to sum up very rapidly. There's some flexibility indeed. from the chairs. Um, can, I, can, I, can I begin uh, by, two, thanking the clerks and my fellow committee members uh, for the work that has gone into this report? I think it's been reflected uh, by the debate um, I think it's been a useful and instructive report. And indeed, I'd like to thank fellow members for engaging uh, with the outcomes of the work. And indeed, I think this thanks is important because I very much joined the committee at the tail end of this. And I think that the, kind of the most input I had was taking part in the hackathon uh, referred to by the convener, which was uh, great fun, but in a sense summed up what I think we need to achieve is that demonstrating that science, technology, engineering, and mathematics isn't just about dry numbers, but is about applying these things for indeed creative outcomes. Um, briefly in summary, I, I won't cover all of these points, but I think in essence, there are um, four or five broad areas which have been covered off both by the report and by members in the debate this afternoon. There's the undoubted importance of culture with regard to STEM, uh, there's issues around uh, teacher education, structure of the profession, the structure of the institutions and support around these activities, access to STEM, um, and above all else in our report, I think the importance of measuring outcomes as we seek progress in these areas. But I think it is important to, um, I think, highlight the importance of tackling the cultural issues. And a number of members, including uh, the minister and the convener, uh, Ross Greer, Willie Coffey, quite rightly pointed out that much of what we need to do is to demonstrate to people that science is for them. Uh, that for people who might otherwise think that, that science rules are quite simply not accessible, not appropriate for them, that that is the biggest task that we have. And that, above all else, for uh, girls is hugely important if we're going to tackle gender imbalances. Um, on teacher education, the structure of the profession, I thought Liz Smith spoke very well about some of the issues uh, surrounding that. And indeed, I think some of the issues were reflected in the report. Indeed, Beatrice Wisher and Jamie Green also reflect on these. We have to treat with caution, I think, calls for altering initial teacher education, because if we were to include everything that has ever called for to be included in initial teacher education, we would never have any teachers entering the profession at all, because by the time they finished, they would have to retire. Um, but um, I, I think we do need to look at the, the, the content, both in uh, continuous professional development and initial teacher education for STEM subjects. In terms of structure, I think uh, Rona Mackay quite rightly pointed out, as indeed others did, the need to uh, differentiate between the different elements of STEM. And I think at the basis of any structural issues, that needs to take place. But likewise, the importance of training for early years teachers, especially given the complexity of the structure of that part of the education system. Issues which perhaps uh, I think could have dealt, uh, we could have covered at more length uh, are collaboration through school clusters, regional improvement collaboratives, and indeed the future role of CERC. Uh, but above all else, I think Alistair Allen made some good points about progress that's been made with literacy and numeracy, and perhaps the need to do uh, likewise with STEM. Um, I, I don't think it's possible to address this uh, topic without noting the issues around access, be they geographic, social, and financial. 
The concept of STEM capital, I think, being noted by a number of speakers is a useful one for contemplating all of these things. But above all else, and in closing, we do need to make sure that we measure this. And indeed, I think it is only appropriate that on a, a report on science that the committee to, indeed took a scientific approach to its recommendations. We had nine uh, recommendations in total which required improved measurement of progress in these out of a total of 22 recommendations. And I hope the government will take forward all nine of those in the report that's announcing next week. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our Education and Skills Committee debate on STEM and early years education. The next item of business is consideration of a legislative consent motion. Could I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 21087 on the Birmingham Commonwealth Games Bill? Thank you very much. The question list will be put at decision time. The next item is... All right, point of order, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Can I raise a point of order understanding Order 7.3.1? Members must conduct themselves in a courteous and respectful manner. And that then also carries through to the Code of Conduct, Section 7.12, for members' choice of language in the Chamber as appropriate and meets the high standards expected by the general public. As I understand, this particularly applies to terms which people find offensive. Having checked the official report today, um, in case I missed her yesterday, I'm clear that in his speech yesterday during the annual International Women's Day debate, Patrick Harvey used the term cisgendered. Cis is an offensive term for many women, myself included. Indeed, I've already respectfully and privately asked a male MSP not to use it in the chamber because I find it offensive. It's a term that's limiting, confusing and divisive. It's imposed upon women, many of whom find it inappropriate and inaccurate, as they do not want to adopt socially determined ideas of masculinity and femininity, and they believe that sex is observed at birth and not assigned. According to MBM, the well-respected policy analysis collective in their paper to the Scottish Affairs Committee, it is a highly contested term and rejected by those who critique the underpinning assumption of innate gender identity. So this term imposes an identity regardless of the true lived experience of sex. It rejects the rights of women to determine their own identity and it implies that since they are cis, they are somehow entitled or privileged. It minimises and even erases the oppression that women face from birth. Language in this chamber is really important and we need to be clear that for many women this is an offensive term which has become weaponised and imposing it invalidates the rights of women to identify as women. Patrick Harvey referred to choice in his speech but ironically he's choosing the terminology about women which many women find completely offensive, disturbing and upsetting. And it is a particular affront that a man chose to do this whilst making a speech during the annual International Women's Day debate, which generally is consensual, and the chance for women MSPs to contribute as sisters across party divides. We do not usually have to contest provocative language used by men during an International Women's Day debate, but perhaps Mr Harvey is not aware that this term is so offensive to many women. Presiding officer, given that sex is a protected characteristic and there are women both in this chamber and among the general public who find the term cis deeply offensive, can I ask you to ensure that it is not used again in this chamber or any parliamentary proceedings? Thank you. Can I thank, you. Can I thank Elaine Smith for the point of order and for giving me advance notice, or at least just before I took the chair. Uh, I, first of all, would say that uh, the respect um, that members need to show each other across the uh, chamber is a matter uh, of order for the chair to rule on. Uh, I have had the chance, however, to review uh, the comments of the contribution made by Mr Harvey yesterday. It's quite clear to me that the term was not used in an inappropriate way. It was not an insult, quite the reverse. It was used in a very, it was used in a very thoughtful contribution about intersectionality in what was a, a consensual debate. Now, the term itself is not a banned word in this parliament. However, I recognise this is a very polarised debate. I also recognise the point that the member made that language is particularly sensitive uh, in this debate. And so I would take this uh, opportunity to members on both sides of this argument and in general to be very careful about not straying from using provocative terms to actually pejorative or insulting terms. I am quite confident that was not the case yesterday. I am quite confident in the chairmanship by the presiding officer yesterday. 
Point of order, Mr. Harvey. Uh, can I just, yes, Mr. Harvey, I don't mind making a point of order, but I'd rather not pursue this argument if we can possible. Mr. Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful. I hope that it's within order for me, presiding officer, simply to state briefly on the record, uh, so that all members are aware of it, that I was conscious when I made my speech yesterday that there are people who reject the term cisgender, who do not identify with it, uh, and would not welcome it being imposed upon them. And I quite consciously and deliberately phrased my, my, that part of my speech in a way that reflected the fact that some do, some do not, and some have no relationship at all to, to the socially constructed concept of, of gender, uh, as many people would put it. I fully respect that, uh, but I am also someone who's happy, as many people are, men and women, to say, I am a cisgendered person, and I hope that others are willing to respect uh, that self-chosen identity. Could I say, um, I, I didn't wish to share this with the Chamber, I am also aware that Mr Harvey is particularly uh, concerned, unconscious, and has raised with me about the sensitivity of language on this issue. So, so I'm just conscious that members on both sides of this debate are very aware of the sensitivities of language. In this particular case, it was quite clear to me that Mr Harvey did not use the term as an insult. It may have been provocative, but it was not an insult. It was part of a balanced contribution. So it is not a point, I am not ruling in favour of that point of order. However, I would note that Ms Smith has made her point very forcefully on the record. If we can now move on uh, back to, not quite decision time. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 21101 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Move, President Officer. Thank you very much. The question is that motion... That no one else has to speak. The question is that 21101 uh, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of 10 parliamentary bureau motions. Could I ask Graham Day on behalf of the bureau to move motions 21103, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10 on approval of an SSI, 21128 on referral of the local government finance order 2020 and 21129 on appointment of an acting convener. Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. So we turn to decision time. The first question is that motion 21089 in the name of Claire Adamson on STEM and early years education be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. The next question is that motion 21087 in the name of Jean Freeman on the Birmingham, or in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick possibly, on the Birmingham Commonwealth Games Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And I propose to ask a single question on the 10 parliamentary review motions. Does anyone object? No. Thank you. So the question is that motions 21103 to 21110, motion 21128 and 21129, in the name of Graham Day and behalf of the Bureau, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move on to members' business shortly. In the name of Aunt Emma Harper, on Eating Disorders Awareness Week, but we'll just take a few moments for members and the Minister to change seats. A few moments, pause.